Lecture 5, Module 4, Measure Stage Part 2, Process Capability. In Measure the Process, in the first module we looked at first pass analysis, time series plots and histograms, then we looked at distributions and various different types of distributions, then we looked at the central limit theorem, and now we'll look at process capability. <clears throat> process capability. We gained an understanding of the frequency distributions and the central limit theorem in the last couple modules, so we're ready to move into process capability. But first we should return to the normal distribution and explore it a little bit more. Now the normal distribution is dependent on two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. The mean determines the relative location of the center of the distribution, and the standard deviation determines the spread of the data around the mean of the distribution. The mean is, is a measure of what we call a central tendency of the data, and is simply the sum of the observations or our data divided by the number of observations and everyone should be familiar with this. So the mean is, uh, x bar is the sum of the x's divided by n. And that just basically tells us the center of our distribution. Now the standard deviation is really simply the mean of the deviations. Unfortunately there's a little problem with that. Here we see a, a number of uh, items and they come out to a mean of 75. So the deviations from the mean are uh, x minus the mean so minus 3, minus 2, 1, 1, 1, 3, and that adds up to 0. So what we can do is we can square those numbers, and we get 24, and then take the square root of those and wind up with 3.16. And that's where we get this funny looking equation where the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the difference of the mean divided by n minus 1. And that's really just uh, calculating, to, uh, squaring to get rid of the uh, negative signs and then taking the square root uh, to get back to the original data. So the values of the mean and the standard deviation determine the appearance of the normal distribution. And here we see a histogram of some data with an average of or a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 10. And we have 5,000 data points. And it looks like a perfectly normal distribution. Now here on the left the standard deviation is smaller a standard deviation of two and a half, so the distribution is, is much narrower looking. And note that the location of the mean is, is off to, uh, to 90, moved over. On the right, the standard deviation is much larger, so a sigma of 10, and the distribution is much wider. Notice that the, uh, the y-axis, uh, x-axis rather, is, uh, runs from 60 to 140 on both of them, so you're actually looking at the same scale. And also note the location of the mean is at 100. Now the normal distribution is also called the z-distribution. The z-distribution is very useful because the area on this curve is well known and the amount of data above or below any given point, or what we call the z-score, or between any two points, can be determined simply by referring to a table of the z-distribution found in any statistics book. And the z-score is a point on the z-distribution, so below uh, we see uh, uh, the, uh, the normal distribution and the amount of area in, in, each, uh, in each section. So at the zero point, which is the uh, is the mean, uh, to minus 1 is 34%. From the 0 point to, to 1 is also 34%. From 1 to 2 is 13.6%. So each of those numbers, uh, minus 3, 0, 2, etc., are z-scores. And we can determine the area to one side of it or between any two scores. So the z-score is very useful because it allows us to calculate the probability of a score occurring within our normal distribution. It also allows, enables us to compare two scores that are from different normal distributions and they have different shapes. So we can standardize to the z-distribution. In the graph below, a lower specification has been converted into a z-score and plotted on the z-distribution. From this we can determine how much of the z-distribution is below this f-score or below that specification. So we decided, or I decided, to select it at, at minus 2, a, a, a z-score, uh, sta two standard deviations below. And as you can see, minus 2 to minus 3 is 2.2% of the area, and minus 3 to minus 4 is 0.2%. So we can just add those up, and we get 2.4% of our data will be below that lower specification. So the z-score can tell us the percentage of the area under the curve for a normal distribution. This is important for process capability because if we use a specification as the z-score, we have a direct method for determining the percentage of data that is above or below our specifications. Now any value from a normal distribution can be standardized or z-transformed into the corresponding value in the z-distribution. This is accomplished using the equation shown below. So here's the value you're interested in, so some x 
and we have the mean of the data, we have the standard deviation of the data, and between those three we can calculate the corresponding z-score. So here's an example using some content uniformity values for 10 tables uh, for percent label claim. So the average comes out to be 97.5, standard deviation of 4.98. So the relative standard deviation there is 5.11%, uh, which, which would pass, uh, and we would say that this batch is good. But let's say we have a lower specification of 90% on this. What is the possibility of, 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 of having failures? So the probability of finding a tablet assay below 90% of label potency would be the probability, uh, probability of x being less than 90 is equal to the probability of the z-score being less than x minus the, the mean divided by the standard deviation. So if we plug in those numbers, the probability of z being less than 90 minus 97.5 divided by 4.98, that comes out to be less than z is less than minus 1.51. Well, the z-score for minus 1.51 or 1.51 standard deviations, is 0.0655, which we'll see on the next slide. So the probability is 0 0.066, rounded up, or 7 defects out of 100 samples, or 66,000 defects per million tablets. So even though we've passed our uh, content uniformity test uh, by uh, USP, we do know that we have failures in this batch. And here's how we find the z-score. So we did the calculation, and we find the minus minus 1.5 and then we look at the intersection for 0.01 so we get minus 1.51 and that gives us our 0.0655 z-score. Since the values of the mean and the standard deviation determine the characteristics of the normal distribution, the process location and the spread, the normal distribution can be used to examine how a process is performing compared to its specifications. And since the z-score can tell us the percentage of data in any area of the disease distribution, we can use it to tell us how much of our data is within or outside of our specifications. Now, process capability is a measure of the ability of the process to meet its required specifications. Process capability is also a comparison of the actual process, which we would call the voice of the, of the process, to the process specification, which we in Six Sigma also call the voice of the customer. This comparison can demonstrate whether the process is centered on the target specification and if the variation in the process meets or exceeds the specification limits. Understanding the process capability allows us to predict how well a process will meet the design requirements of our product. Specification limits really should come from the voice of the customer and should be determined either from customer requirements or some industry standards. Uh, they should not be arbitrarily set which happens quite often. The maximum amount of variability in the quality of the process, the spread of the process data, that the customer will willingly accept should be the basis of your specification limits. So let's look at a calculation for this. It's really a simple ratio, so it's nothing more than a specification limits divided by six sigma, the range of the data. So here we see the spread of our specifications from the lower specification limit to the upper specification limit, and here we see the range of our data, or the spread of our data, six sigma. So the calculation for process capability is nothing more than the upper specification minus the lower specification divided by six sigma. And here we see some examples. So here we see a process capability of one, a perfect fit up in the upper left hand corner. And we see that the spread of the data is exactly three sigmas on either side, six sigma is exactly equal to the spread of the specification level, which was set at three sigma. So the CPK, CP comes out to 1.0. In the upper right, we see that the specification has been expanded out to four standard deviations, and our data is still at three, and we get a CP of 1.33. Bottom left-hand corner, we've gone out to five standard deviations, and we see that we have now a process capability of 1.66. And then finally, we go out to six standard deviations, and we have a process capability of two. For a process to be acceptable, it really should meet four basic criteria. The process must operate in a consistent manner, shouldn't be bouncing all over the place. The process must be stable over time, it shouldn't drift off, shouldn't bounce around as I just said. The process mean should stay on target, it shouldn't be off target. The process variation must not exceed the specifications. Now if a process does not meet all of these criteria, then there is a risk of producing significant out of specification product. Now this is a process that is capable and centered. As we see, the process capability is one, and we see that the center of the data is smack on target. And now we see the variation. 
spread of the data fitting between the upper and lower specification primarily. Now this is a process that is not centered, but it's still capable. Okay, so the process capability is 1.01, but we see the sample mean is 96. It should be on, on target of, of, uh, of, uh, of 95. But note that some data are outside of the lower specification. Now reducing the standard deviation this process will improve the process capability. However, the process is not on target. Note that the CP considers only the spread and not the centering of the process. Now you can have a capable process that has a process capability greater than one, but still make out of specification product. So we have another measure called the process capability index, and it's also sensitive to the centeredness of the process, not just to the spread of the data. So here we see another example, the calculation uh, using the upper and lower specification that the process is closest to. So on the left here, we see that the data is farther away from the lower specification limit than it is from the upper specification limit. So our data is closer to the upper specification limit, closer to failing that limit. So instead of, the, instead of doing the spread of all the data and the spread of the specifications, we take the average and we look at the spread of the average to the upper specification limit and the and three sigma. So we get a calculation that is CPK is equal to upper specification minus the mean divided by three standard deviations, three sigma. Or, if it's on the other side, the CPK is the mean minus the lower specification limit divided by three sigma. In combination with CP, the CPK gives an indication where the process is off center. If the process is centered, then the CP will equal the CPK. The greater the difference, the more off center the process is. This process has better capability, smaller standard deviation, but is not centered. Note here that the CP is 2.52, but, but the CPK is only 1.75, since the process is close to the lower specification. Note again, if a process is centered, then CP and CPK will be equal. If they disagree, the process is off target. So a process capability 0 to less than 1 is unacceptable, sometimes called not capable. Greater than 1 to 1.33 is fair. Greater than 1.3 to 1.66 is acceptable for many processes. Greater than 1.66 is considered exceptional. And 2 and greater is 6 sigma. Sigma means standard deviation, and 6 sigma means 6 standard deviations. So a CP to CPK equals 2 is 6 sigma from the center. This is exceptionally good, hence the name 6 sigma. So here we see the CP is equal to 2, and that will be a sigma of 6. Now another measure of process capability is the percent defective in, in the process, and this can easily be found by calculating the z-score and then using a z-score table. However, parts per million is used more commonly these days. Percent is, is way too high to be acceptable these days in terms of quality. So we look at the number of failures in parts per million rather than parts per hundred. Now this is used when the percent defect becomes so low that it is more convenient to express the number of you know, defects as parts per million. Uh, PPM cannot be found on the z-score tables, and it has to be calculated using statistical software such as MiniTab. DPMO, or defects per million opportunities, is a measure of the number of defects in process divided by the number of opportunities for the things to go wrong. So the next slide from lecture two revisits the calculation for picking and sticking, two different things that can go wrong for tablets, for a particular tablet. So DPMO is the number of defects observed in a million opportunities. It is calculated by dividing the number of defects by the number of units manufactured multiplied by the number of opportunities per unit for defects, and then multiplying the product by a million. Below is an example for tablet picking and sticking defects. So we have tablet defects. We can have picked or sticked. We had 50 picked uh, divided by 750,000 tablets, but there were two opportunities for picking and sticking, and uh, that comes out to 33 defects per million opportunities. Now there are many different ways of measuring a process against its specifications. Six Sigma created one common metric that can be used with all data types in different work situations and is, and is relatively easy to understand. This measure is called the Sigma level and corresponds to several typical process measures. 
So when we look across here, let's look at the sigma level one on the left. Uh, the DPMO is 691,000, so the percent effective is quite high. 69% would be defective. There would be a percent yield correspondingly of 31%. And then you see short-term and long-term process capabilities there. Now if we run down to the six sigma, uh, six, six sigma level, you'll see the defects per million opportunity is 3.4. Again, remember this is considering the 1.5 sigma shift. This is not the true value. Uh, and the percent effective would be then 0.00034%. Percentage yield is 99.99966%. Quite a big difference from sigma level of 1. And our short-term capability is uh, 2.0, long-term 1.5. So this is how these all uh, stack up to each other. Note again that the sigma level is also the same as the z-score. Short-term versus long-term capability. Short-term capability is measured over a very short time period, uh, you know, focusing perhaps on just one machine with one operator running it uh, during one shift. So the short-term capability only provides a, a quick snapshot of the process at a particular time. Short-term data may not contain any special cause variation, which, if present, could show up uh, in long-term data. So short-term capability normally appears better than long-term capability data. Long-term capability is measured over a much longer time period so that the influence of all potential factors, such as different operators, different shifts, different raw material lots, different environmental conditions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will be included in the process capability measurement. So the data in this time series plot over the short term has one apparent capability, but over the long term has another much wider capability. So short term data can be misleading and making judgments on just some a small amount of short term capability data uh, may, may be dangerous or, or misguided. Now CP, P, PP and CPK, PPK, short term capability is measured as CP, CPK and indicates how, process, how the process may be capable uh, performing. It looks like it's capable of performing. Long-term long capability is measured by PP or PPK and indicates how the process is performing. Now note, there is a considerable disagreement and confusion in the industry over the definition and use of these terms, CP, CPK, PP, PPK, short-term, long-term. Uh, just go do a search in, on Google and look at all the different def definitions you'll find. Uh, everyone looks at it a little bit differently. Uh, and you may find the various sources define them differently and weight their significance uh, differently. But to summarize, short term uh, represents the process capability. Long term represents the total variation of the process. Short term may only capture variation due to common causes, where long term captures variation due to both common and special causes. Short term measures variation with a subgroup or between successive values. Long term measures variations all the data. And short term is used for calculating control chart limits. Uh, long term uh, is, should not be used for calculating control chart limits since variation from special causes may, may be included in, in the limits. And there's some contention on that as well. So the two different calculations would be short term, uh, again using control chart factors as you see there. So the uh, range divided by D2 or the standard deviation by C4 or the moving range divided by D2. And then the long term is, is the actual calculation using standard deviation. Another measure is uh, CPM. This is also a process capability measure developed by Dr. Junichi Taguchi and provides a measure of how aligned the mean is to a target. Uh, CPM is used to reduce the variation from the target. Uh, normally, the center of the, uh, of the upper specification and lower specification would be the target. However, that's not always the case. Uh, this, the, uh, the, the customer may want uh, the specification, specification to be somewhat off from that. So CPM actually takes that into consideration. Now, once again, note the use of all these indices and, and these equations varies by the industry and the author. Not everyone agrees with them or uses them.